Thank you for joining us for the first in a series of GLTF virtual meetups. Joining us for today are Alexi Medvedev from Meta, Mike Cruz from KDAB, Jatinda Kukadeja and Ahmed Pandey from Super DNA 3D Lab, and Julian Berta from Smart Pixels. First, a couple of housekeeping items. If you have any questions during the presentation, please ask them using the Q&A feature located on your Zoom toolbar at the bottom of your screen. We are recording this video and we'll share the link along with the slides and the recording shortly. At the end of the session, please complete the short survey form to help us better design future events. With that, let's get the webinar started with host Alexi Medvedev from Meta. Alexi. Uh, hello, everyone. My name is Alexi Medvedev. I am a chair of 3D Formats Working Group. And let me introduce the agenda for today. We have a three presentation. First one is integrating GLTF into Qt3D uh, that were presented by Mike. And uh, second one is overcoming the challenges in e-commerce content creation presented by Jatinder and Amit. And the third one is 3D in fashion, baking non-standard Unity materials into GLTF. It will be presented by Julian. And after that, we will hold the uh, open QA uh, and a session that you ask any questions related to the topics and uh, just GLTF uh, format itself. And uh, let me pass the stage to Mike. Mike. Thank you, Alexi. Uh, let me share my screen. Um, welcome, everyone. Uh, so, as um, just um, previously alluded, my name is Mike. I work for a company called KDAB. We do consulting services um, for lots of variety of topics, and in particular, we do um, a lot around 3D technologies and how to integrate uh, 3D models um, inside uh, applications. So in order to um, make this easier, over the years, we've identified a, a number of patterns that um, uh, were uh, problems we need to address and um, uh, repeatedly uh, solve. So we've actually produced a library called Quiza, which uh, uh, helps us um, integrate 3D content into, um, into various applications. Um, so mostly the kind of thing to we're trying to do is to take uh, the models uh, as they are uh, created from by content designers and integrate them into the final application and uh, the very type of application we're talking about is the thing you would find in your car the thing you would find in the airplane um, a lot of it also you'll never see because it's uh, in um, sort of industrial applications where they would have 3d models uh, to uh, help the operating of uh, equipment and um, that kind of thing. Um, so we're not just talking about rendering the 3D model, we're also talking about interacting with it, triggering some behaviors in it, um, linking it to some application data uh, and so on. And it's mostly on that part, integrating the model, um, that um, we've uh, identified things that we can um, uh, help uh, clients with uh, using this uh, library. Now, of course, taking the model as, is, as it was designed uh, and integrating it into the application, that's the ideal um, use case for GLTF. That's essentially what GLTF was designed to do. Um, and it can take in not only the 3D model, uh, its geometry, its appearance, but also a lot of the behavior um, like animations on the object and uh, animations for the uh, viewpoint and things like that, that the designer will um, spend a lot of time creating. And then uh, the RTF makes it really easy if you have the right tools to integrate inside your uh, application. So GLTF is the right tool um, to do that. Um, but uh, as I said, we have um, sort of come across uh, various issues with using it in applications. So we've Come, we created this um, library called Quizza. It's actually got three parts. Um, there's um, design tools, which are essentially plugins for Blender and Maya, which enhance some of the GLTF-related workflows, um, mostly to enable the users to um, use some of the extensions that we've uh, designed. I'll come back to those later on. Um, we also uh, have a set of tools that are, can be used both by the designer and by the developer 
in order to inspect the GLTF model so that the designer can actually see how it gets rendered. Uh, it will get rendered into the, the final um, application that the developer can inspect the content of the um, GLTF model and find out what the name of the various uh, components are, what's the name of the application, the animation that it needs to trigger and things like that. And the third part, and it's the one that I want to spend um, most time talking about today is the actual um, engine, which does uh, the rendering and the runtime um, access to the, uh, to the 3D data. Um, so our uh, 3D engine um, has actually got two backends. Um, the one I'm going to present mostly today is the one that we wrote initially. So we do a lot of our work, um, even when not concerned with to do with a library called Qt, um, which is designed to rewrite uh, write cross-platform uh, applications. And we created a 3D library for it called Qt3D. Um, which is a general purpose uh, 3D rendering um, library. And Quizar basically sits on top of that to um, load up the GLTF and provide access to um, all the content uh, through, so that the uh, developer can actually uh, not only render the object, but trigger some behavior and integrate it in the uh, application itself. So that library has actually uh, two APIs, which are identically the same feature sets, uh, but one is written in, in C++ and the other one is written in a language called QML, which is a declarative language that comes with Qt, uh, which makes it a lot more uh, easier to write um, some types of uh, applications. So this is essentially what I want to show um, in this um, demo. If um, I right, type the right keyboard shortcut. Um, so the kind of application we do here, uh, this is loading a GLTF model. Uh, all the animations were loaded from the GLTF. So both the camera motion and then triggering the animations on the object. Uh, these animations are completely controllable by the developer, uh, including providing a custom clock to control their speed or their direction. Um, we can, of course, um, change the environment map. So this model uses um, the PBR that comes with um, as part of the default GLTF specifications um, so that we fully implement that. And the next release will actually also support clear coat extensions and things like that. Uh, but then we also have additional post-processing like uh, this uh, overlay mask. So these triangles that you see moving about are are just added on top as an overlay. And another thing that's really useful for developers is to be able to manipulate the properties of the material. So all of that can be done uh, from uh, the application. And there's a bunch of other things that uh, you can do with, um, with this application. So the way this is done is actually really simple because you create a 3D view and then we just load um, the, um, the file uh, the GLTF file directly, okay? That means that if the designer comes up with a new version of the file, the developer doesn't need to change any code because we are directly using the loading up the GLTF. Uh, then there's uh, a number of things that uh, you want to do. For example, we want to make sure that um, we use some uh, animations. So in order to do that, we need to be able to refer to an object that is comes from the GLTF to um, uh, get uh, have access to the um, uh, to the loaded camera. So in order to do that, we use what's called an asset. Um, so the library maintains a list of objects that were loaded from GLTF, uh, and it builds actually lists per type, and we can get a camera by name. And once you do that, then you can actually have access to the camera. And in this case, we are doing it to change the aspect ratio of the camera when we load, the, when we load that. Um, another thing you can do, uh, which is um, quite interesting for the developer is to be able to access all the animations that are defined inside the um, GLTF file. Um, and in order to do that, we basically uh, use uh, an animation player object here. 
uh, and we can refer to uh, an animation by using the name of the clip that was defined inside the GLTF file. So all, you know, you'll notice a pattern here, the animation player finding an asset, all this is based on name of resources uh, inside the GLTF file. Admittedly, that is potentially a bit brittle, um, but that's the easiest convention to adopt um, when you want to share models between the designer and the uh, developer, because the develop, you know, they can share the name. And I'm not going to show it today, but this inspection tool that we have um, that lets you preview the scene will let you find the object, the name of various objects, and so click on something in the 3D and get the name of it, so the developer can identify objects um, really easily. Um, so this is basically lets you um, play uh, some animations defined in the GLTF file. Um, and uh, yeah, all the things that I, uh, another things that you need to be able to do, for example, is to um, uh, access materials. So that, that again is done through uh, an asset, if I can find it here. I can't find it here, but basically, this animation here that lets me uh, find, uh, change the color of the material is um, just basically grabbing the object that represents the GLTF material assigned to the body of the car here and uh, edit the base color properties of the GLTF uh, fairly easily. Okay. Um, so that's the basic functionality of Quizar. It makes integrating these models uh, into the uh, 3D applications uh, much easier. Um, and it lets the designer and the developer basically share these models um, and uh, update them uh, much more, uh, much quicker than it would do um, without the facilities of GLTF and of Quizza. Of course, this is just in this small application, we are just uh, rendering the model as is, so we're not doing very much to it. Um, but one of the things that we can do is integrate GLTF into a more um, featureful application. So in this case, we have um, another car. Uh, and again, just the simple you know, demo uh, applications, but um, one of the things you can do is integrate it in uh, different scenes and add some different effects. So you have the facility of loading your GLTF, but you also have a full featured 3D rendering engine that goes with it. So it becomes really, you can do some quite uh, interesting things. Like you can, for example, do uh, the kind of things you would find in the car. So all these models, the car models are loaded from GLTF. Uh, the rest of the scene is dynamically generated based on some uh, fake data, but it basically makes it really easy to kind of do this kind of uh, integration, adding some information. You have, if there's another car shows up, you have the proximity uh, indicators that get added. So all of these things that are the 3D side of things, uh, the aspect comes from the designer, uh, but it's all connected to application data and that gets um, integrated um, in real time. And then you can also do these kind of things. So here we have our GLTF model added into a scene where all the 3D objects are uh, basically uh, created in real time, uh, loaded up from OpenStreetMap. Uh, and created in, in real time, just integrated like that. And of course, you can also um, control uh, various things on your scene like that, um, but you have access to all, all the data. So the code for this application is obviously a little bit more involved than the first one, uh, but here you can see the various uh, controls uh, that you have on it. I know there's everybody from Germany, but if you find out why they picked this color for the taxis, I'd like to know. Um, so one thing about this car, though, is the, a lot of these applications, so this is running on my um, desktop here, uh, a lot of the uh, applications will run on cars and airplanes and things like that, and car manufacturers will sell you very uh, expensive cars. 
but they are quite um, reluctant to spend a lot of money on uh, having a proper computer with a proper graphics card um, in their car. So we have a lot of performance issues when it comes to um, handling these uh, these models. So that comes uh, that basically means that we've introduced a number of extensions um, to uh, GLTF. Uh, in uh, our engine, in particular, when it comes to the materials. So we support the PBR materials that um, are defined in the, um, uh, in the GLTF specifications. But we introduced sort of an extension to a GLTF, which uses uh, other materials, uh, we call them the IRO materials. Um, they don't use a um, environment map. Um, well, and don't have to use an environment map, and as such, they're much simpler. Uh, the computationally, they're much simpler to render, and they work on um, lower end hardware. But you can still have some interesting effects. So the car scene, I've closed it down now. But the car scene, the last one I showed, that uses these materials. It wasn't um, wasn't GLTF. And we have a number of the other extensions. For example, that applications had multiple scenes um, and all, most of the scenes would load the same car, uh, which means that potentially you would load the same resources multiple times. So we have an extension that prevents that by adding a unique ID to uh, things like buffers and buffer views in the GLTF files. That means that um, they can actually, the quiz I will know that something has already been loaded and reuse the OpenGL resource that's already been allocated. So it, improves a lot switching um, switching scenes um, uh, for the for the runtime of the um, application. That's why I don't have time to talk really about uh, this. There's actually a second backend um, for the uh, rendering in Quasar. Uh, so there's the one we just saw uses Qt3D. Um, a lot of our clients now um, don't want to use Qt anymore uh, for a variety of reasons. Um, uh, maybe they never have or they don't want to use it anymore. So we now have actually, a, um, as part of Quasar, a full-featured Vulkan-based scene graph uh, renderer. Um, and um, we can have a backend uh, that uses that and exposes the same functionality. Uh, API-wise, it's all written in C++. Uh, but it exposes the same functionality that you have uh, using the Qt 3D. So you can do all of this, but without Qt, it will, um, you will usually use some kind of UI. So it will um, integrate with a variety of UI toolkits, um, like the Deer EM GUI, or um, if you want to write, use web based technologies to write the UI, you could uh, use a library called RML UI. Uh, we integrate it with uh, Flutter. Um, we integrate it with Slint, which is a new library to do user interfaces in Rust. Um, so we integrate also with that. And um, yeah, that's about all I um, have the time to go through. Um, so just highlight quiz of how it helps you. Um, helps the developer uh, and the designer integrate 3D objects inside the applications. Uh, that's about all. So pass over to the next speaker. Uh, thank you very much, Mike. And the next speakers are Jatinder and Amit from SuperDNA. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Uh, we will be just stopping up, uh, picking up the topic of overcoming the challenges in the e-commerce content creation. So we will be focusing more, more on the 3D content creation part, and we will be focusing more on the GLTF. So that is our agenda. Uh, my name is Jatinder Kukreja. I'm CEO and founder of SuperDNA 3D Lab. It was started in 2017. Our major focus is uh, uh, 3D content creation for various 3D applications. And what we do is uh, we have multiple pro production pipelines depending upon the input source to the output delivery. So we manage end-to-end -end content management and the content production. I'm here with my uh, colleague, uh, Amit. Amit, can you introduce yourself? 
Thank you, everyone. Uh, this is Amit Pandey, Team Manager 3D Production at SuperDNA 3D Lab. I'll be picking the uh, some great examples of uh, 3D GLTF assets. Thank you. Amit, can we move to the next slide, please? All right, I will pick it up uh, as the market overall. We started in SuperDNA around 2017. And I just wanted to pick up this topic, uh, which is pretty common question that, okay, how GLTF is evolving, how the real-time asset creation is evolving. So this 3D content creation trend is what we see in super DNA and around us. Uh, just to give you a, a fair idea that uh, in a year, we do create around 100,000 assets. So it's a pretty significant amount of uh, number of assets. So far in last five years, we have done around uh, 350 to 400,000 uh, assets. And we have seen a lot of shift. So if you, for example, see when we stepped into this 3D asset uh, in e-commerce, we are showing about this. So initially in 2017, the major focus in the industry wise was to get for CGI, which is we call it as computer generated images. And that was primarily for the high poly models. So that was the primary market. And as we see now that if we go around 2022, and uh, in this year, we will be also touching around 100,000, close to 95,000 assets. And out of them, 80% of are getting done for the real-time assets. So definitely there is a lot of, uh, uh, lot of, lot pick, lot of, lot of, let's say, traction, traction towards the uh, real-time assets. And there are, uh, there is a total, uh, uh, there are a lot of challenges, a uh, lot of, let's say, advantages also. So Amit, can we stick to that slide, please? Previous one. So for example, uh, the GLTF is the lightweight format. So that is uh, the number one reason. So which is basically making it easier for people to go to the real time 3D content creation. Uh, the end consumer always look for that, okay, is this the photorealism? and the 3D real-time asset because the, the major uh, discouragement initially was that the models look like uh, too cartoonish or they don't look real. So the customer doesn't get a very good experience in 3D. I think that was the photorealism part is the part which was becoming a, a, a major a blocker for uh, uh, the real-time assets. The editable and customizable part, what do we mean by that is that it becomes easier now with, with this GLTF that uh, we can just go and edit this uh, uh, text file and we can link texture with this. Summit will pick it up more on the technical side. It makes it backward compatible and future ready. So multi-platform rendering support by mean is that, okay, there are various 3D applications which are coming it up, whether we talk about 3D viewer, we talk about 3D configurator, and whether we talk about a lot of uh, uh, content marketing, we are talking about, for example, Snapchat. So this particular GLTF enables you for all the platforms. I will go into bit, uh, dive into it more in detail in the next slide. Uh, this is more of a super DNA production pipeline, but uh, I won't say that this is super DNA production pipeline, but this is uh, uh, just a replica of whatever is happening right now when uh, when the retailers and the brands uh, are moving from uh, uh, 2D to 3D. So we have the first challenge, which is the multiple source of information. Uh, we have a lot of brands which just comes with the CAD drawings and they have their ask to get them converted to the real time models, uh, assets. The second one is the scan is getting very popular. We call it as more of a retopology part. The third one was very typical one and very common one is the reference images where you already have the CGI images or you have the photo shoots done in the photo studio or you have just some renders out of that and uh, combined with the product information data, you would like to get the your 3D models done. Internally, we have uh, uh, modeling, texturing and 3D assets. So modeling is done separately, texturing is done separately. And these two are different skill set which is getting used and they combine on the 3D assets. Uh, the real-time asset creation guideline, which we generally follow, most of them is by uh, Kronos. And if we say that 70% is common across various 3D application, and of course, uh, when we say build once use everywhere, it, if, 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 if a brand is creating an asset and he knows that 70% of the cost is saved and he can use in all these applications, I think that's a very big win. 
um, and the and the bottom layer is quality assurance. Quality assurance is uh, semi-automated. You still need a manual intervention over there, which is a little bit little bit of challenge, because when we talk about the realism and consumer experience part, nobody wants to take a risk. You still need to have a look into this that whether it match, matches the original images or not. The typical platforms which are getting used is, of course, the e-commerce platform. If you go to Amazon, you go to Wayfair, you go to Crate and Barrel, Lois. I mean, some have many of them already using this real-time assets. Uh, the social media channels, uh, Snapchat is one example which I came on. You go to Meta. Uh, 3D viewer is pretty common. I mean, this is also, for example, if you go to Shopify, Shopify already provide AR and you can also have the 3D viewer. The brands are also implementing the viewer on their own site. Kronos has their own uh, viewer open source, which you can use. Virtual try-ons is another application which is a, uh, which is getting a, a very popular. Uh, the recent example is you can see from Amazon, shoes and IVR are picking it up and same thing is getting a, uh, like a few days back, I think a week back, uh, the, the Snap and Amazon partnership popped up again in the news and then it's the same kind of asset which is going to get used on Snap also. There are various uh, floor planners, uh, which is uh, uh, helping uh, uh, and the virtual decorators, so which are again using the GLTF assets. So the idea to use to show these slides are that uh, that this this whole is streamlined over the period of time. That even though there are multiple sources of information, there's a clear cut pipeline, and the GLTF as a as a format has helped and helping everybody in terms of using various applications. So you can uh, as a brand they can have a multiple revenue stream, which is going to happen. We'll deep dive into more. Uh, I mean, this is a vast subject, but here our focus was more on the uh, GLTF part. I will let Amit take it over, which uh, in which uh, uh, he's going to take deep dive into the further GLTF technical topics. Over to you, Amit. Thank you, sir. So looking at the trends uh, that have been shifted from traditional uh, modeling and texturing and techniques that are used to produce 3D assets, uh, let's say for uh, high poly renders also, or even for gaming or even for uh, um, lightweight GLTF assets also. So uh, we were pretty much limited to few modeling techniques, uh, let's say polygonal modeling, spline modeling, or a patch modeling. But now we all know that we have 3D scanning, photogrammetry, retopology, and uh, geometry nodes, which is a great thing, and procedural modeling also. So uh, talking about procedural approach here enables us to, uh, I mean, change any parameter at any given time, right? Which was certainly not possible with standard polygonal modeling. If we were to change any XYZ thing in our 3D model, we would have to probably make it from scratch or to put a lot of effort into adjusting the mesh and all those things. But um, in procedural approach, we can simply uh, tweak the parameters and get the desired results. And um, Another important aspect of uh, uh, 3D asset is texturing. So uh, pretty much we all were uh, focused to PBR workflow only, which comprises of uh, base color, normal, metallic, roughness, and opacity maps. But now we have uh, um, actual physical Kronos extensions by which we can enable uh, real physical transmission values, sheen values, IOR values, specular color, and few other extensions also, which enables us to physically utilize the these very parameters. We do not no longer have to fake out all those details. Let's say to make a glass, we often used to tweak opacity, and to make velvet, we often used to tweak roughness and normal channels. But uh, now we can actually add those physical parameters. We will explore the examples in next slides. And talking about uh, material variants also, we can utilize all these Konos extensions onto the very same model and um, maybe uh, we can showcase multiple material variants. KTX is a very uh, crucial, important and uh, in my opinion, a revol uh, revolutionizing tool because with KTX integration with the GLTF assets, KTX is not some uh, basic, just a regular compression method. It's kind of amazing. Like, as you can see in this image, like on the left, uh, the asset is of 12.8 MB that utilizes JPEG plus PNG maps. And the memory consumption for this very asset is 96.2 MB, right? Uh, so this is uh, the story for every uh, 3D asset talking about GLTF. 
and on the right hand side you can see a ktx converted asset which is utilizing less uh, memory that is 10.4 and talking about the video memory is significantly less at 21.4 mb right so uh, this is a huge shift and once again there is no uh, um, or compromise on the quality part of the site like the jpeg plus png's quality uh, will not be compromised at by any means in the ktx converted file uh, so what ktx does so ktx actually uh, comprises and decodes the maps into the readable format uh, for our platform like uh, let's say it is android or pc or windows or anything it is quite natively supported as of now and on ios also it is getting rapidly developed so uh, for our gpu or for our mobile phone it no longer have to process the asset uh, from all the way it is kind of pre-processed that is what ktx does here we have some um, good examples of the Kronos extensions. On the left, you can see a uh, furniture which is uh, without sheen, which is not utilizing the sheen parameter. And on the right, you can see that very model with the sheen parameter. Uh, talking about backward compatibility and future ready as well. Uh, so let's say the asset on the left was made probably a year ago or two years ago, right? So by then uh, we didn't had this sheen parameter or let's say it was made three years ago, right? So to make that asset, which was made years ago, uh, compatible or enabled to use this sheen parameter, it is totally possible. We simply have to put the uh, GLTF code in uh, any editor of your choice, let's say Visual Studio. So take uh, the code to Visual Studio, edit that code, and we can simply enable it to use these very parameters. And if someone may, um, expect that what will be the size increase in the asset so not at all uh, because these extension extensions are shader based so uh, there is not much of a difference in the map size or uh, mesh size or overall the asset size it is pretty much same if uh, if to give you a number it will barely increase by 0.1 or 0.2 uh, megabyte right this is another good example of uh, Kronos extension. On the left, you can see we have uh, a glass made using opacity. You can see it is pretty much dull. All the reflections are pretty much scattered and flat. But on the right hand side, you can see um, we are utilizing an actual transmission uh, parameter here. And you can see the very good reflections and uh, physical properties also. Also, if you may notice that on the left hand side where, where we are using opacity, the inside of the chandelier is not visible. The bulb is not visible there. But while using the um, Kronos extension of transmission, uh, we can see inside of the bulb and the filament as well. Right. Uh, more of these examples are totally available on our website, which I will show you right now. Just give me a second. Yeah. So um, I will be dropping this link in the chat for all of you in a few seconds. Uh, here you can see uh, all of our models. Let it load. You can also view it in AR and iOS also. You just have to scan this code. You can see all these things, right? And uh, taking some another example like this. So this was again made uh, using different approaches also. We used 3D scanning, we used photogrammetry. We made these shoes and other assets from images and also from uh, 3D scans, right? Like converting images into a 3D model and converting and cleaning up the scan. So we use multiple techniques, whichever works best in which case, right? So here is another pretty good example of the asset. And we have all of other um, categories also, like this is another single seater sofa and uh, we have um, large sofas also like this again these all are utilizing the chronos extensions of sheen if sheen parameter was turned off on this uh, sofa it would look a bit dark but as you can see this is pretty much photo real as of now and this is another example and once again these all are pretty lightweight if you were to open this on uh, your mobile phone or maybe any other application it would run as smooth like this only as you can see it on my screen right 
then we have other home appliances tables and so on we, we have very good examples for clothes also that i will show you just now like this and once again you can notice the photo realism of this and if you talk about the size of these asset it is it is um it is enough to be run smoothly on any platform right so that was all from my end thank you thank you uh Jinder and Jinder and Amit and the next speaker is Julian from smart pixel okay hi everyone so i'm uh, julian i'm the ceo of smart pixels um and i'm going to be talking about um how we've developed a, a content production pipeline for mostly fashion assets uh, a way to get them from unity into standard uh, gltf assets so what is it that we do uh, we create photorealistic product visuals in 3D for brands. So if you follow the super DNA slides, we're on the left-hand side of that slide where we mostly use CGI because um, we are trying to produce you know, photographic replacement for uh, marketing asset creation. So it has to look as good as a photo. We've been doing this since uh, 2015. And, uh, you know, sort of what we do falls into one of these four categories. We digitize products. So yes, 3D scanning, photogrammetry, all of that good stuff to get uh, physical products into uh, 3D assets. We have a rendering platform, cloud-based rendering. So mostly uh, CG, it's real-time rendering, but it's cloud-based. Uh, but we'll uh, see through the slides that this is not the only, uh, the only avenue for us. Uh, we also create product configurators and we have enterprise connectors because uh, very often those configurators are transactable, meaning that they are integrated on e-commerce platforms and they allow you to configure and buy products. Um, so again, digita digitization of the asset put into our cloud rendering platform, sort of select which type of rendering you're going to need, static shot, static shot with a background, augmented static shot or dynamic, you know, video or animated turntable. And then uh, just like uh, uh, Super DNA mentioned, you can use those assets on a lot of different uh, experiential channels um, after that. Because we work mostly with uh, luxury brands, the digitization and the, the visual fidelity of the assets is paramount, um, you know, so, as you can guess, very advanced materials, things that would not easily fit into a GLTF file as is, uh, very high poly, the stitch points are geometry, for example. So there's a lot of geometry, a lot of detail, very, very high resolution texture maps, um, detail normal maps, you know, when a, when a product is handmade, it's very difficult to convey that emotion in, in computer graphics. So you have to have irregular stitches, you have to have sort of imperfections to the product so that you can convey the, uh, the craftsmanship that um, was involved into making that product. Uh, this is another example of craftsmanship. It's actually tattoo, like you would tattoo your skin, but this is tattoo on leather. So you can imagine that this material, uh, because it causes displacement, displacement, pigmentation of the skin, um, it can be located anywhere on the shoe. It is hand drawn. It comes from a designer drawing. So making this image possible is, is quite an involved process. And throughout that process, we're going to create custom shaders uh, in Unity, which is our rendering engine, because the shader needs to mimic the craftsmanship. So the shader parameters and the shader attributes have to be related to how the craft was used to create the image and in the back and forth between us and the brand to get those image approved and you know have them declared as good as a photo um, we need to be able to speak the same language as as you know the brand as the craft so this is another example of a detailed normal 
that creates creases in the leather. And it's super important to, uh, to give it this non-CG aspect as much as possible. Another you know, few examples of <clears throat> what those images look like. Again, these are real-time rendered, but they're cloud rendered. You know? they, they wouldn't run on your phone typically. And this is an example of when the CAD data is available, but again, a lot of material and model preparation needs to happen so that this photo, uh, this rendering that looks as good as a photo uh, can, can uh, be created. So this is all you know, fine and well, and you're creating those images in the cloud, but what if you could create them uh, in browser? So if you could do the rendering uh, on the consumer side, uh, what are the pros and cons of doing that? And what if you could do both? That would be even better because then you don't have to choose. So like I said, when we create a material in Unity, we write our own custom shaders and they have a lot of different attributes. Take this uh, crocodile skin, it has uh, three, a minimum of three different colors, the main color, the of, you know, the sort of the shaded and then the, um, the region between the scales is a different color. It has several normal maps. It has, it has different uh, maps that control uh, displacement, that control, you know, in a word, a lot of different attributes. And this is very often the case in fashion because, for example, if you do fabrics, you can't really have an albedo map. You're going to have a color per thread, typically. So having just one color map is not going to cut it. Um, in luxury, stamping is a very common practice to change the, the shape and the appearance of a piece of leather. And so that needs to happen at a very high resolution if you're gonna do close-up shots. So normal map details, so normal map inside normal map is also a pretty common uh, uh, tool that we use. So let's take you know, the example of this material. It has a color main value. It has a specular color main value. It has a smoothness map, which is not, not you know, it doesn't match one to one what would GLTF would expect. It has a different tiling on different maps. So there's a lot of little tricks that we've used that we needed that in the in the sort of content creation part of the pipeline. That's gonna you know sort of get in the way of it, saving this thing as as a valid GLTF file uh, later down the road. So we've written our own internal. Uh, Unity editor and Unity runtime tool. Uh, what it does is it parses the entire scene mesh by mesh and it finds all the materials. And for every material, it creates a shader variant with new output modes to the shader. So it allows us to ask that material, render a specular smoothness map, render a roughness map, render a normal map by combining all your different normal maps into one render uh, an AO, render your mission, and render your uh, your albedo and alpha. So it's sort of a way to project a very complex shading and lighting environment into what GLTF dictates, you know, it supports. And good news is it supports more and more things. So we just have to add new output channels to our uh, shader distiller, that's how we call it, uh, to be able to take those super high fidelity scenes and target whatever the latest GLTF uh, version is. And now you see that same mesh with the original material in the back and the, uh, the sort of rebaked or distilled material in the front, as you can see, it's a standard Unity shader. And now it has a lot less parameters. It's been all baked in or distilled in, but it's ready for GLTF export. And this is built into our cloud platform. So not only can you ask for a JPEG, a PNG, a PDF, an MPEG rendering of your asset, but you can ask for a GLTF or USDZ DZ rendering of your assets. So uh, what does that look like? So this is our cloud platform where a brand would come to um, you know, pick up, pick up a visual for their e-commerce site or whatever. So we're gonna go to this product here. Um, we'll make it a little more interesting by uh, customizing it or something, you know, change the, change the back shell to be 
navy blue, for example, and we'll ask for uh, hero detail rendering of that. So that's just you know rendering your static at rest JPEG asset. But the other thing you can do now is you can ask for the export of that into um, a USD format. So if we look at what that does uh, over here, take that in here, that same asset has now been baked or distilled into a GLTF file. And it, you know, it uses all the attributes of GFTF, but not the original attributes that we needed to create that asset. So it gives us the same visual, you know, digital twin that can live as a cloud rendering source or as an in-browser rendering source. And once we've done that, because, because now we have an asset that exists on the sort of backend server side and on the front end side, we can build um, 3D product configurators that use both worlds at the same time. And um, what that looks like, if I can show you. is a, a 3D product configurator like this, where when I'm moving, I'm in GLTF render mode. And then when I'm releasing the mouse, I'm getting the cloud rendering pipe in. And I can configure the asset. And as I do so, it configures its server side and client side. So if you look, for example, at the reflection in the metallic parts in GLTF, I don't have them. But in render, in cloud rendering, I'm able to compute them. And my lighting model is also you know, more realistic when I'm coming from the cloud. So this for us is sort of the holy grail of helping brands move back and forth. And depending on the quality, the device, you have an older phone, you can't spin that thing around, you're able to do, um, to do a little bit of both. And that's what I have to show you. So um, I guess I'll uh, give the share back to um, the moderator, I think. Um, thank you very much, Julian. And I think that's the time for Q&A session then. Uh, so we have a questions. Let's start with the question number one. Julius asks, hi, will GLTF support will get reflected in PySide QT for Python? I think that's the question to Mike. Yeah, I think I'll take that one. Um, so it's uh, there's two sides of uh, Q GLTF support. Um, there's So the, the rendering bit, Q3, QT3D, is reflected to um, PySide and Qt for Python, and that's done at every release. When it comes to the GLTF support, so there is basic GLTF support in the official Qt3D, but it, it is just loading the mesh and the materials. It doesn't, and it's, it certainly doesn't... Um, cover all the details of the GLTF specification. If you want full GLTF support, you need to use Quiza, uh, which is what I was presenting. And that does have a also a Python API um, that, um, uh, that we maintain, although I don't think we've actually updated it for the latest 2.0 version of um, Quiza. But short answer, yes, there is support uh, for Python APIs to access the GLTF, including uh, if you use Quasar, triggering animations, having access to assets and so on. Okay, uh, thank you very much. The next question is from Eric. Uh, what are some of the current limitations of GLTF you would like to see improved? Amit? Yeah. But I'd like to take that one. So uh, although GLTF assets are pretty much fine in multiple viewers, but uh, still talking about accuracy, there is slight differences uh, of the same asset on uh, different viewers. Maybe if we may work on that stability and accuracy also with some extensions also like transmission or maybe opacity as well and sheen as well, they behave little different uh, just minor on different 
platform so if we may solve that that will that, uh, that will take our goal of build once and use everywhere to newer heights thank you and maybe julian you can answer this question as well sure thank you like i was saying in my talk um Oftentimes, you need to customize the attributes of the material to fit sort of a, a purpose. It's, you know, you're not talking to a, to a shader author or to a developer or a mathematician. You're talking to someone with craft, someone with expectations of how a material will behave. So the holy grail to me would be shader nodes directly in GLTF. Um, that's you know probably pushing it, but at least some basic behavior of doing transforms, you know, rotating the normals, um, changing you know composition of certain maps. But before we get there, I guess uh, stickers. So maps in maps. I think I've mentioned that for stamping, for example, being able to stamp locally the normal map with a normal map detail uh, would be super helpful. It, it would be true of all the maps, not just the normal map. Um, anything that gives us control over how the final buffer of the map gets produced and, and composited would be super helpful to uh, to bring those materials over. Uh, thank you very much. The next question is anonymous. Uh, it's just more like comment. <laughs> Uh, this is interesting because Blender 3D has procedural uh, materials, and when you're purchasing an asset, the materials are often procedural and have to be baked before exporting, which doesn't look the same in the browser. I'm wondering if Blender is going to be touched on this meetup. Uh, I probably can answer this question, so that's not much question, uh, because now we are not discussing Blender this time, but we do support GLT FPBR materials as the uh, Blender material node. If you're specifically targeting the Blender support in this case, you should consider this. And besides this, uh, well, uh, we can guarantee that uh, as, as probably you're speaking like about Material X uh, or some the, the similar floor. We can guarantee that work uh, work consistently everywhere because by the nature of this Material X, it's designed not for the to not to be like a runtime uh, uh, friendly or uh, transport friendly. So that's probably the answer here. And next question is from AC Cable. Will GTF support animated texture, UV animation, or an, and or flipbook animation? I probably can answer this as well. Yes, uh, at, some, at some point, yes, we will support this. Uh, we're working on the, on the similar uh, extension that will allow to uh, animate uh, different uh, uh, GLTF properties, not only uh, animations as we have right now. And that's the other question. Are KTX converted files supported by multiple and diverse platforms? I mean, yeah, KTX converted files are uh, supported on multiple and diverse platforms, but uh, as I said earlier also, it is uh, not at all natively supported by the iOS platform, but uh, on Android and on Windows and uh, other online browsers, they do natively support it. And for iOS as well, it is being worked upon. Thank you. Okay, uh, next question is, uh can you share something more about the gltf format being backward compatible in the future ready Amit? yeah yeah like i shared one of the examples of the sheen parameters so let's say if an asset was made probably three years ago using substance painter or blender or any third party plugin and it it uh, it, at that time, it was not utilizing the Kronos extensions that we have now, such as transmission, such as Sheen or IOR or any XYZ. So uh, taking that GRTF asset, um, which was made a few years ago, into Visual Code, uh, Visual Studio for um, any editor of anyone's choice, and we can simply link the shader that we have now to that asset uh, with few uh, tweaks in the code and we can simply run it on any platform we like that is what precisely makes 
uh, a GLT of backward compatible and future ready as well. We can do it with all the extensions of Kronos that we have today. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, the next question, uh, Anonymous, are you going to work on the Blender GLTF exporter to include, the, for example, more shader nodes, so I need to bake textures? And what is the timeline for it? Uh, first of all, the current approach how we, uh, that we're used for PBR materials, we just specify the specs for the extensions. Uh, they, as probably you noticed, they based on the uh, onion uh, rings approach, so you build the different extensions on top of each other. And for a GLTF standard, it's up to runtime or the viewer how it will support this. But the way how we export, expose this for the uh, any kind of asset creation uh, tool sets like a Blender, uh, usually they implement the full set of the all the ratified extensions. If you'll check the current PBR material node for Blender, uh, basically it exposes all the all the extensions that we uh, we keep on our GitHub. And I think that will be uh, presented this way in the future as well. As soon as we'll ratify the new extension, it will be expressed as the part of GLTF uh, PBR material node, and then that you can you can start to use this as is. And we uh, we have no notion to any kind of shader nodes. So again, we expose on the, the properties for the ratified extensions. Uh, the next question is, do you think high poly renders will be history very soon with the advancement in the GLTF format? Uh, Jitinder? Yeah, I can pick that up. Uh, I, I, I don't think it will be a um, history because overall, even though in my slide I mentioned that uh, that the the demand of real time assets is increasing, but if we pick up for example what Julian gave a lot of examples where the photorealism matters a lot, so there is a two kind of industry trends which are happening. The one part is that where there is a real photography where you have to bring all the way the product to a photo studio, and there is a logistics involved, and then there is a, a warehouse and storage, and then sending the product back. So that part is involved. So which is basically the real photography that is getting first place replaced by the virtual photography. And that's where the high poly 3D model comes. So that is also a rather advancement, the digitization of 3D assets, which uh, Julian highlighted is uh, happening a lot. And the second part, which we mentioned is that, uh, uh, I would say that GLTF part is that, okay, you have the 3D model, whether it is a high poly or getting created from scratch, can the product be visualized by playing it in a, like an immersive experience? So that's another. So I won't say it, it is like a history, all this will go hand in hand. And these two are like a, uh, like the, the pillars in which the, the world is move, moving from a 2D experience to the 3D experience. Uh, that's uh, what I would like to say. But uh, yeah, over the period of time, for example, we talk about metaverse, and the more and more 3D experiences are gonna come. So these are like the basic pillars which are getting, uh, ba basics which are getting set it up now. I can I can probably add a word or two to that if that's okay. Um, because Draco compression works so well, we're also seeing that sometimes it's, it's cheaper on model size to use geometry than to use uh, say normal maps. Now on KTX that may change again, but uh, I was talking about stitch points earlier. Uh, it's literally hundreds of thousands of vertices and they compress very, very well. So if you're gonna do, you know, stitching on cloth, you might as, if you have the geometry, use it because it's, it that model will download very fast and will render very fast because well, geometry is cheap now. It's cheaper than textures apparently. That's what we're seeing on our end. When, if you have the high poly, you should use it with full geometry because it just, it works really well. Thank you. And that's the last question. Uh, for KTX and business side of 3D asset production, you might prefer, oh, sorry. So I did, yeah, uh, that's not a question. <laughs> that just comment. I'm sorry about that. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Alexi. Thank you, Mike, you. And Tender, Amit, and Julian. The presentations were very informative. Well done. We appreciate your time and effort today.
As a reminder, a recording of this presentation along with the slides will be available on the Kronos Group website and a direct link will be sent to you in a follow-up email. As you leave the webinar, please take a moment to fill out the survey that pops up. Your feedback is important to us and helps us improve these presentations. Please let us know if there are other Kronos related topics you may be interested in. And thank you for joining us. We hope you enjoyed your webinar. Have a great day.